pull up the YouTube. I actually did mine ahead of time. I'm so proud of myself. <gasps> I'm so <laughs> jealous. <laughs> it only took me like a year and a half. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it either. You both look so cute. There we go. Oh, hi, Nana. Ah, she's so prepared. Nana's on top of it every time. I like didn't go to bed until two last night. Um, my roommates and I were watching Halloween um, and I went to bed at two and I woke up at six because I heard some banging outside and I was like, nope, I'm not going to get Halloween. I'm going to stay up until that banging stops. <laughs> oh my gosh. No thanks. <laughs> Mike Meyer be, be out there killing other people, but I was built different. <laughs> <laughs> You're vigilant, and I respect that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, it's Mary one of those Margaret. things where you're like, it's probably nothing, but I'm not going to be the idiot who thinks it's nothing and then dies. Like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, every time I watch a horror movie, I'm like, I don't mind if there aren't any Black people in here, because that's not how we operate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be uh, not beneficial to the movie to have more Black people, because they'd be like, no, I'm not going in that haunted house. Bye. Like, yeah. <laughs> Are you stupid? Like, <laughs> they need the people to die. That's why all these white people are here. Yeah, yeah they'd be like, like, Billy, let's go see what's going on. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Every time, like, someone tried to kill my Michael Myers by like stabbing him, I'm like, you did one stab and threw away the weapon within arm's reach of him. Like, no, you buffoonery going <laughs> wild. Uh, so we're just going to wait like another minute or two for people to mm -hmm. trickle in. Um, how was the Renaissance Fair, Julia? It was amazing. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Both times that I went this year, this weekend and last weekend, I came back and I was like, I feel ill. <laughs> like, I just <laughs> do not feel good. Last time I had a migraine, I threw up last weekend. Oh, no. probably was uh, my own fault. But, um, <laughs> I one drink and I still felt nauseous when I came home and I'm like what the heck is going on here so wow. oh my gosh I don't know but I took a wee 15 minute nap I'm eating food <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I still have glitter on my cheeks I don't know how much you can I tell. love it though <laughs> yeah it's really cute it's festive yeah outfit did not try but the face is still mostly festive and it's a mukbang this week so yes. for this month it makes sense. You're on theme. You really are. If there was ever a time to eat for our live show, it's this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I just forgot to look up the definition of magical realism so I could read it out loud to people. And I was like, oh my gosh. Last, not, yeah, last night when I was finishing this book, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is probably at. I wasn't thinking about the House of the Spirit, so it's probably my second. But I was like, this is probably like the second ever legit magical realism book that I've ever read. Like if you're remaining like really true to the genre um, definition. And then I was like, magical realism? Is that what it's called? That doesn't sound right. And I had to look it up. I was like, is that even what it's called? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right on point. Um so I'm going to go ahead and get started, and then we can move into our discussion, which will involve magical realism. So hi, everyone. Welcome to our Past Classics live show. Today, we're going to be discussing Like Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel. Um, and I feel like we should do our normal routine and go around and introduce ourselves. So Kara, would you like to go first? Sure. So oh, I sorry. And also let us know what your relationship with this book is and if you've read it before. Sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> Um, hi everyone. So my name is Kara. My channel is Wild Book Garden. Um, I read pretty much everything. I'm very passionate about that. Um, and as for my relationship with this book, I have I have never read it before, and I've kind of always had it in the back of my mind as something I'd like to try because I have discovered over the last few years that I'm really into like cooking magic or baking magic as like an element of a story. And I knew that this was kind of one of the more famous examples of that. I don't know if it was like the thing that started that trend, but I think it's like one of the more well-known examples. And I know there's a movie, but I've never seen the movie. And I knew like the very basic outline of the story, which is like doomed love. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that was pretty much all I knew. So I went into this not really um, 
not really knowing how things were going to go. Nice. And Julia? Yes, I'm Julia. My channel is Shakespeare and such. It's right there under my face. <laughs> um, I literally, I don't know why I had never heard of this book until Taylor, you like suggested it for the book club. Um, I think mentally, everything with the word chocolate in it, I think is Chocolade, which is one of my mom's favorite <laughs> movies. And I was like, maybe it's that. It's not that. Um, <laughs> So not, I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into and it was a wild ride, but um, yeah, no, I had never heard of it. And I'm curious, I don't know if she's written other books, but I would consider giving them a try. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm Taylor from Page Screen Taylor. I read books kind of all over, but right now I've been focusing on classics, romance and sci-fi. Um, and I've never read this book. It's been on my shelf for, I think, two years. And it was re recommended to me by a friend um, because I'm Mexican-American. And I went to her because I wanted to read more like Mexican literature. Um, and th this is my first time reading it. And yeah, I'm looking, I want to see if Laura also read more because I would definitely read more. Yeah. And sort of going into my next question. Uh, what are your thoughts on this book and what was your star rating? Uh, let's do Julia first. So it was quite a journey. Um, I started off really, really loving it and my enjoyment lessened as we went on. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just some like really, I know we'll, we're gonna get into all of it, but some really specific <laughs> plot points that I'm like, hey, why? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was weird and uh, I mean spoilers but not spoilers because I'm going to be vague not happy with the way the romance plot line went at all I'm very upset yeah. <laughs> so that was a bummer but I ended up giving it three and a half stars like there were still things that I enjoyed and overall I'm not like mad that I read this book like it was very I think I told you Kara I was like it was like compulsively like readable, like I just kept going with it. So that was good. But yeah, it was confusing, especially the last chapter. Why was the last chapter so confusing? Like the rest of the book, <laughs> it was weird, but it wasn't confusing until the last chapter. And I was like, whose wedding are we at? When are we? Huh? Was <laughs> the timeline was wild. Yeah. <laughs> <It> was a lot. <laughs> uh, Kara? Yeah. So I think I even said in my Goodreads review. Um, I say review. It was like three three sentences. <laughs> um, but I also had a similar experience. I was really into it at the beginning, and like I, I was feeling like it was kind of heading towards a four star book. I was really liking it, and by the middle, I was like about at a three and a half star. I was still really enjoying it, but like there were more things I didn't like. And by the end, I'm say I would say I'm like at a three star. Um, I am also though really glad I read it. I've like been meaning to read this for ages and I did enjoy it and like you said Julia it really was compulsively readable um like it read so quickly I think for me like I liked a lot of the pieces of the story like I thought the characters were interesting I thought the themes were interesting I liked the writing I really liked the structure of the book and yeah. like the, the use of food and everything um but a lot of Laura Esquivel's choices with the pieces I really didn't like um mm -hmm. like the things that she chose to do with the characters and like relationships and like certain tropes I was not a fan of messy so yeah <laughs> yeah um and so I think I rated it higher than both of you I gave it four out of five stars part of it is um I did like some of the mess <laughs> <laughs> we should have known you would <laughs> I was like the drama of it all <laughs> but um I just I really enjoyed the characters the writing style I felt flowed really well, mm -hmm. uh, which also made it contributed to it being readable. Short chapters, which I also love. Yes. Um, and I like the characters. I love the character of Tita. Um, also Gertrudis. Uh, yes. More rights for Gertrudis. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just liked how everything played out. And I do agree that some choices with the love interest I did not enjoy. But given my prior experience, like from what I've read from magical realism books sometimes things just happen and it's like yeah why not let's sure yeah 
Yeah. Here's yes. brother. I'll drink to that. <laughs> is so accurate. <laughs> I'm thinking of Bless Me Ultima, where so many things happened. Some of them didn't even make sense. And I was like, yeah, cool. <laughs> but I wanted to, before we got deeper into our discussion, I did want to go over content warnings for everyone. So we've got abuse, both physical and emotional, sexual assault, suicide, grief, cheating, and fat phobia. Uh, so just be warned, these will probably, we're not saying they're for sure going to come up in our discussion, but they might. So I wanted to know what is your prior experience with magical realism and what did you think of its use in the book? And actually I should read the definition of magical realism just for everyone out there. Um, so it's a 20th century style of, this is according to Wikipedia. It's a 20th century style of fiction and literary genre. Um, and it sort of paints a realistic view of the modern world while also adding magical elements, often dealing with the blurring of the lines between the fantasy and the reality. And it's used by several different cultures, but predominantly like Latina cultures in their writing. But I've read it, um, I've read it like in like Asian and Asian American literature as well as black literature too. So yeah. So uh, who wants to go first for? Um, okay, yeah, good. Um, so I think I already, briefly mentioned. So I've read The House of the Spirits by Isabel Allende, which is like very similar in many ways with like love triangles and ghosts and the family multi-generational stuff and the war and revolution. And like a lot of themes were very, very similar. <laughs> um, it's just like a much longer book, um, which honestly I do you think I ended up liking more than this one a little bit? But just because I think with more time to like sit with those characters, there was like a lot more time for characterization because we were seeing them like over a longer period of time. Um, but other than that, I don't think I've really read any like true official magical realism, you know, because it's like it's it's a factor or a, a section of like, you know, kind of general low fantasy stuff, but because it's its own thing, I think those are like really the two legit ones that I've read. So it's still like a genre that I'm more curious to get into and kind of like see how I feel about it. Cause there are a lot of things that I like in magical realism, but I'm also someone who, <laughs> and you guys have heard me say this in like other books we read, like I'm very literal. Like sometimes like, I don't know, like, okay, but is this happening or is this a metaphor? Like, <laughs> Or is the shower on fire? Oh, it's really on fire. Okay, got it. Like I need to help. So it's it's a hard genre for me to process at times, but it is one that I think like has a lot of beauty to it. So yeah, uh, Kara. Yeah. So um, I have had, I guess, relatively little experience with magical realism. Although I've read more than a couple, I never used to like it. Like magical realism slash fabulism. I really did not enjoy it because I read a couple of books that were kind of like that and that I really hated and I, it just kind of put me off. Mm -hmm. um, and then I discovered Anna Marie McElmore, who is one of my all time favorite authors in the world. <laughs> and I will <laughs> sing their praises all day long. Um, and I think like they just do really beautiful books. And so that kind of made me realize like, oh, I can really enjoy this. Like this can be a genre that I really love. But outside of their work, I haven't read a ton like I've read a couple books here and there like um above us only sky is one which is I believe fabulism not magical realism but kind of like similar and I really loved that one but generally like I feel like most of my magical realism experience at this point is Anna Marie McElmore which is great because <laughs> I love them um and I also wonder if like they're obviously currently writing today so I wonder if the differences I feel like between their books and this book that we read, I wonder how much of that is like a trend in the genre, you know? Mm -hmm. Cause I feel yeah. like with Anne-Marie McElmore, they're, one of the reasons I really like their books is the magical realism aspects feel very natural and very like well worked into the story. Um, 
And for most of this book, I feel like that was true. Like I was surprised when the first couple magical realism things popped up because everything else read very contemporary or like historical. Yeah. Um, but like overall, I feel like it was like pretty well worked into the plot. And then at the end, it felt like it wasn't as much. <laughs> Like things just kind of I was like oh yeah, okay the tornado <laughs> the chicken tornado like I just that was that was a big one <laughs> so for me I think my prior experience with magical realism is I used to actually not like it mm-hmm. um, I don't know if either of you have read Br- Bless Me Ultima but um, I want to reread it eventually because maybe my opinion would have changed now that I understand like more about magical realism than I did when I read it, but I did not like that book at all. And this was the book that sort of turned me around, especially like you said, in the first half where it sort of makes sense, like putting emotions into your cooking and it, you know, it makes other people feel the same way or being so passionate that you're literally like on fire. Like that, it works so well. And even the end with like the bridal like blanket or something that she was sewing that it was so big like I don't know yeah. stuff like that I think is really good and I'm looking forward to reading more magical realism because I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna look into them and also Isabella Allende's House of Spirits too because I read Isabella Allende before and I really like her books listen I'd like to read more from her too I do not recommend um What's the name of it? That fabulism book that everyone was obsessed with a few years ago. Oh, Ava Lavender, The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Ava Lavender. That was one of the books that I hated with the fire of a thousand suns. And I'm like, is magical (laughs) realism just terrible? (laughs) So personally, I would not recommend that one. (laughs) Yeah. I'll keep that one. Is good, but just go into it expecting literally any and every trigger warning. Anything okay. you think that might be disturbing in any way, it's going to be mentioned at some point. Okay. Literally. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, so before we get into more discussions as to themes, I want to talk about the characters because I think we're going to have some big opinions on some <laughs> So let's talk about Tita first. Um, so what were your thoughts on Tita? I liked her. Um, yeah. I think... I mean, she was in a really terrible situation and I think she was kind of doing the best she could. And I feel like even though kind of the whole premise of this book is like cheating and you kind of know that going in and that's not, I I think that's not something any of us really enjoy reading in general. Um, But it bothered me a lot less here because I'm like, everyone involved knew this was a bad idea. Like the mother knew she was forcing this to happen. The sister knew that how these two people felt about each other. So not that like, oh, you deserve to have a husband who hates you, but, like, you kind of knew what you were getting into. And um, I feel like Tita really did everything she could to, like, not let it go that far. Um, and, yeah, I just I just enjoyed her overall. I really liked all the cooking stuff about her and how, like, that was really... It was nice to see her have, like, a passion like this that was, like, yeah. so important to her. Um, I liked some of her female friendships, like some of the ways that those characters ended, I was not a fan of, but I liked that we got so much interaction between women. Um, yeah, so I was, in general, I was a fan of Tita. I I, I have issues with her taste in men, <laughs> but I liked her. Yeah. Julia? I really liked Tita too. Um, I think, Kara, it's funny that you mentioned like the whole cheating aspect because I thought the who was it? Maybe it was like Chincha or someone who was talking about how, or maybe Gertrudis was like, I think it was Gertrudis who was like, the truth, what is the truth? Like, you know, the truth depends on your point of view. Like, yeah, you could say like, hey, Tita, you're messing around with your sister's husband. Or you could say, hey, my sister married the guy I'm in love with. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> oh, there's, there's a lot of perspectives here. Um, so that really helps, I think and empathizing with Tita because I just I was like dang girl like you've got like so much you want to give and everyone's like holding you back like she just felt so stifled and then the way things came out in her cooking was just like so beautiful and I loved that so yeah overall I have positive feelings about Tita I did like her (laughs) I agree with you too I thought she was a really interesting character to follow and you know I just felt so bad for her for like basically the entirety of the book I was like 
wow, Tita and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad life. <laughs> Really yeah, I but I did enjoy like the passion she put into her cooking and just how there's this idea of reason versus passion or tradition versus passion. Mm -hmm. And that usually manifests itself in, like I said earlier, fire um, and apparently chicken tornadoes. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be careful with those chicken tornadoes. <laughs> but I agree with you, too. I really liked her. And I'm going to jump ahead to the messy part. Uh -oh. Talk about Pedro. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> we both go. Uh -oh. We all just go. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. I was reading. Maybe it was somebody's. Maybe it was someone's review. I don't remember. I think it was on Goodreads. Somebody I follow. Um, they had really enjoyed the book, but they mentioned that like Pedro was kind of the worst. And at the point I was in the book, I was like, I mean, like, I don't like him. He's not like super well developed, but I don't like dislike him. And then like the book keeps going and I'm like, oh no, like Pedro's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> no, cause listen, I've read the house of the spirits and Esteban, he's the worst. So oh, no. Pedro, I was like, this guy's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, Kara, I don't know if you had more to say about Pedro. <laughs> no, like, I mean, he just, uh, he, he's he also was, not he, that bright. Yeah. <laughs> he's he not, not the sharpest tool. You're not dead. that bright. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just like, he was so frustrating because, I mean, he was an annoying character in a way because like, he wasn't well developed at all. Like he yeah. had like no personality except being in love with Tita. And it's like, because I liked Tita, I kind of cared about him a little, but like not very much. And then like the only characterization you get from him is like that he sucks. So it was just, <laughs> it was like hard to buy into this great love story when I'm like, like I I added this book to my girl can do better shelf. On the <laughs> if, that, if that tells you anything, like I just, I'm like Tita, like you're better than this. Like everyone <laughs> is better than this. Like, yeah. I don't know where I was going with that. This is just me complaining about Pedro. <laughs> Good to let it out, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to share something right now about myself. That's a little, maybe a little problematic, but I like it in fiction, not in real life. Okay. So it's fine. <laughs> Any love triangle that involves like two siblings and an extra person i get so excited that's so <laughs> spicy because, like well theoretically like you all care about each other you know like mm -hmm. every love triangle in which all three parties have some concern for the other two people in some way is so good like twilight is boring because jacob and edward hate each other they don't care if the other person dies or disappears tomorrow you know but if you're like i love you and this person that's important to me loves you. What do I do? Like, that's intense and dramatic. So when Pedro pulled Tita into that hug at his wedding and went, now I get to be near the woman I love, I was like, buckle up. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. So unfortunately, it kind of went downhill from there. But um, <laughs> theoretically, it, it really got me jazzed. Uh, no, I, that was a good moment. I was like, oh. Like. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wish that I don't I don't know what I wish had been different specifically. I don't it's hard to like pinpoint like, oh, if this had been this, then it would have been fine, you know, because it's like a whole amalgamation what amalgamation <laughs> of uh like the later characterization of yeah. Rosaura how do you say her name Rosaura I think yeah um and like the way Pedro acted with Tita after he was married and the fact that he was like so blinded for his love with her that he would like not even consider oh if we run away I won't see my daughter again like that should cross your mind Pedro yeah. I just remembered that he lost a child and it's like he never like noticed like he never... <laughs> yeah we um, hear way more about tita's grief in that yeah. than his yeah. <laughs> one thing i also found like irritating about pedro and this this wasn't like problematic it was just like kind of ridiculous and i got tired of reading about it it's like 
Tita would be doing like a normal thing in the kitchen. And he's like, oh, when you grind those spices. <laughs> and it's like, I listen, I get that you're like fantasizing about her constantly, but like let the woman make her dinner. Like calm the fuck down, Pedro. You know what? Maybe, maybe kitchen utensils should be less phallic and maybe <laughs> Maybe there should just be things that uh, don't look so sexy in the kitchen. Yeah. Well. yeah. I mean, like, there were a couple, there were a couple parts where, like, it made more sense, like, when he ended up, like, touching her calf or something, and I'm like, okay, like, that's, obviously, that's not something you would normally do. I get why that would, like, be a big moment for you, but there were a couple times it happened where I'm like, how, why? Like, <laughs> I'm just imagining him standing in the doorway of the kitchen whenever Tita's cooking, and he's just... <laughs> I'm a Taurus. I think food is sexy too. I relate to Pedro in that way. I love it. I was like, yeah, tell me more about the food. (laughs) I also don't like Pedro. Um, He is trash. And also, like I said, not that bright. His grand plan is to marry the woman he loves sister so he can always be near her and not think, maybe this is a bad idea. Um, And also, I just, I got so so ticked off when uh, Tito was going to marry John Brown and he was like how we're in love why could you do this and I'm like my dude (laughs) sir please um one you're married to her sister so you can't talk and you chose to you weren't even forced to and also like out of necessity Tita kind of needs to get married too because she's a woman uh living in John Brown was nice to her who wouldn't marry John Brown (laughs) yeah I, the reason so his name is so boring is because he's so delightfully boring. I love him. Yeah. <laughs> so and, like, stable. He went, he went so like, stable. out of his way to, like, not push her, like, when she was, like, really upset and, like, traumatized. And, like, even though, because at first, I'm sorry, if I'm getting ahead of, like, the questions, please stop right. me, Taylor. You're no, good. Talk about John, please. I just, yeah, like, he's yeah. just the best. And, like, at first when he was introduced, I'm like, stop creeping on her. You're just the doctor, like, yeah. who's here to... Yeah treat someone like just go home Mm -hmm. but then we see him again and he like actually cares about her and he's like taking care of her and he never tries to make her feel like she owes him and he like talks to her about his family and about like he has that beautiful speech about like matchsticks and how like (laughs) you need to find people who like light you up and it's just he's so sweet he's like so nice and he never pushes her and she's like what if I don't (laughs) like (laughs) (laughs) but he doesn't he doesn't make me feel bad enough. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like I want, I want to hate myself when I marry my husband. <laughs> like that's what Tito was looking for, I guess. No, I mean that that speech he gave to her about like, if you don't marry me, that's the closest I came to crying in this whole book. There were tears <laughs> in my eyes, and I was like, John, John, please. And then. Laura tricked me because the next chapter she's like, ooh, it's a wedding. And I was like, is Tita finally doing it? And then she was dancing with Pedro. And I was like, is she marrying Pedro? And then it wasn't even her wedding. And I was like, I don't know what's happening. I guess I'm also (laughs) confused. Sorry, this is going to be a writing question, not a character question. But I thought (laughs) because the recipes were month to month. Yeah, that story was being told month to month, and all of a sudden it was like, "And this child is ten. And I was like, "When did they turn ten? <laughs> and like all this stuff was happening, and I was like, "Huh?" So I'm a little confused about the timeline of this story, honestly. It was not until the last chapter that I realized <laughs> it was not a year. Like, yeah, because they said like Tita's like 39 now, and I was like, "She's yeah. what? Yeah, <laughs> okay. twenty-two years went where? Who? Like, <laughs> it was the end of the book before I got it, and also." I only got that there was a time jump at the end. I did not notice that we were just skipping time like yeah. throughout. Yeah. My biggest or like my closest assumption is that the months and the dishes associated with those months are like, you know, maybe in Mexico, like the Three Kings Day bread that's right. clearly centered around a holiday. Yeah. So I'm wondering if it's mixing that traditional cooking with like the holiday or Times of the year when certain food is in season or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I figure probably still these events took place like within that month of the year. But like what year? We're, I don't know which year, but some year that month. Yeah. <laughs> it was a September. 
(laughs) There had been been a little more detail on that because, like I said, I'm a very literal person and I get confused. My little pea brain needs facts. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that last that last chapter and it's like, oh, she was 38. And I was like, wait, she was 30 or like 39. And I was like, she was 38 when the book began. Girl, why are you listening to your mother? (laughs) Oh my God. Yeah, it's like the last chapter, one of the things that I finally like, that made it click is, is like, and then her and Pedro had been having an affair for 16 years. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> like, that, doesn't, that doesn't math with like, <laughs> what's happening. You know the picture of that blonde lady with all the equations? Yes. <laughs> Literally. But yes, I also like Dr. Brown. I had a crush on him. I was like, yeah. yeah, Pedro can go to hell. And this guy seems stable. He's got a career. What's Pedro doing? Yeah. <laughs> Fighting. I mean, he he makes what what was his name John too? John Gray? Yeah. Were they both John Color? They're, they're John both John Color? Oh my God. Uh, yeah, John Brown makes John Gray seem like a loser. John Brown is yeah. like the man. I love him. I love like a the- boring, stable, patient man. Uh. <laughs> like and the thing that really, really won me over to him because I was kind of at this point, I was afraid to get burned again. I was like, "Are are you going to turn out terrible?" Like yeah. I'm trying to prepare myself, but like multiple times he went out of his way to like not rush Tita and to like make sure he's like. If you, um, like, wasn't there a moment where he even was like, I want you to, like, be happy that we're going through with this marriage? Like, it just, he was, he was just so supportive and so nice. And. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the thing that gets me is, like, he keeps checking in with Tita about whether or not she wants to get married to him. And he, like, really takes her opinions and feelings into account. Whereas the minute Pedro can't marry Tita, he's like, I'm not even going to talk to her about this. I'm just going to marry her sister. And she should intuit my plans. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this is, like, that classic thing that that always irritates me. One of them is, like, Pedro gets so angry as soon as somebody shows interest in Tita but he has like not done anything towards like making their relationship actually work Mm -hmm. like he's just content to let like Tita be miserable and abused like for years but the second an actual nice person is like treating Tita well he's like he's offended and he like starts trying to sabotage everything like it just Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mary Margaret. <laughs> yeah. Here, I'm like, Mary Margaret says he's got Kara's people. She's verklempt. She's so mad. She doesn't know how to say it. I am. Um, it's true. So uh, let's move on to Mama Elena, who Ooh. was a piece of work. I did enjoy her backstory, mm-hmm. but my God. Like, yeah. grow from your past, please. Like, <laughs> listen, I will. I'll give. I'll. I'll give Mama Elena a shout out for this. That scene with the shotgun was so badass. I loved where she was like, "No, no one's going in my house," and I'm not kidding. <laughs> like, it was amazing. And I was like, "Wait, do I respect you all of a sudden?" And then she went back to like abusing Tita, and I was like, "Okay, well, this doesn't work for me anymore." But a good scene, a good one scene you had. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she was not not nice. At the end, when Tita, like, told her mom that she hated her, I was like, yes! That being, like, the magic words to get her ghost going away, I was like, that's so powerful. Like, mom, I hate you. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. I also think, like, it's very, this is going to sound horrible, like, satisfying in, like, a symbolic way that, like, Mama Elena literally killed herself with her own suspicion. Like, like, not, I mean, not that yeah, I want her did. to kill herself. Do you know what I mean, though? Like, yeah. it's like she brought about her own downfall by being horrible. <laughs> right. Yeah. And by not trusting her daughter. Yeah. Who has been nothing but way kinder than she deserved her oh, entire yeah. life. Yeah. Which also lets you know that Mama Elena knows that she hasn't been fair to Tita because she's scared that Tita's going to, like, poison her the minute she can't really fight for herself. Mm-hmm. It's true. <sighs> Yeah, I can't stand her. I thought her backstory where she, like, you know, fell in love with, like, 
a half black man and that marriage couldn't happen. Uh, I, I thought that was really interesting and it might also give some insight into why she's so bitter all the time, but also like, don't take it out on your daughter. Yeah. yeah. Also, I feel like if you're kind to your daughters, they'll want to take care of you in your old age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. None of you. And also, done. like, why was it a choice? I'm sorry. Did I just? No. You just... Go. Why was it a choice between like, I will keep my daughter bitter and miserable and alone and force her to take care of me versus like, oh, I'll let her get married and she doesn't care what happens to me. Like you were saying, Taylor, it's like, it, I mean, Pedro and Rosara like stayed there. They stayed at home for a long time. It's like why, like why couldn't um, Tita like get married and then also take care of her mom because she's the youngest? Like it just why, like why are you making this an issue when it doesn't have to be? Yeah, and why didn't Rosara? She, she has one kid, and not saying that one kid isn't hard to raise because you know that is. But you have one kid. You can also take care of one mom. <laughs> I just well no because Rosaura sucks at everything. She's like, I can't cook. I'm not a very good mom. I'm just. <laughs> I mean, the, her characterization is like a whole thing. But anyone else, yeah. yes, theoretically, they could do both. Yeah. Like between between all the different family members, and was Chencha a servant or she was a servant? And then before her, there was oh, she started Nacha. 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 Thank you. She wasn't in the book nearly as much as I thought she was going no. to be. So I like forgot her name. Um. But it's like between like all the family and the help you have, like you're gonna be fine. Like, why are you making this? Like, <sighs> yeah. yeah. Um. So super fast before we talk, move on to themes and stuff. Do we want to talk about Rosada and Gertrudis? Gertrudis. Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> what was every single character choice made for Rosara? What was it? What were all of them? the physical descriptions of her made me like physically angry. Like, yeah. I was, you know, the scene in Clue where she's like, flames, flames on the side of my face. That was me reading the descriptions of Rosara after she gained weight. Yeah. Like, why, yeah. why the really weird specific descriptions of her bad breath and her flatulence and dying via farting? Huh? <laughs> That was an interesting way to go. That was a choice. Like, <laughs> like all of it is so weird. I just don't understand. And it's like, I, I guess, I don't know. It just seemed like it would have been, again, more compelling for the character dynamics for like her and Tita to have some kind of positive bond other than like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess our mom is the same person. You know, like that's not a very captivating <laughs> relationship. Yeah. Um, so it just seemed like it would have been better. Because, like, Tita even had times where she was like, oh, I feel kind of bad for my sister. Let me help her. And then her sister went back to being awful. And I'm like, well, what's the point? Yeah. 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 We had those, like, couple of moments where I got excited because I'm like, oh, are they going to, like, try and work together or, or try to at least, like, have some kind of peace, you know, temporary yeah. peace between them. And it's, yeah, it, like, never happened. I also, like, the descriptions around... Rosara when she gained weight were infuriating and the way that that was placed in the story like in the other writing really irritated me because the way it was written it sort of implied like well can you blame Pedro for like cheating yeah. on her with her sister and I'm like yes I can <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, it before, before. so yes <laughs> right yeah and it just yeah and like yeah, I just had a lot of issues with the way she was written about and she just wasn't like like what what was her motivation as a character like i don't i don't even know why she married pedro like is it because her mom like said to i guess um yeah, like she didn't yeah. really seem to have like strong attachments to like anyone in the story or or like anything that happened um i think yeah. she reacted more than pedro did when her child died but that was like about it um yeah, yeah just like a wasted opportunity with her I feel like mm -hmm. yeah I feel like they could have done something like to characterize Rosada as being like jealous of Tita not just because of her relationship with Pedro but maybe she feels like you know Tita's prettier or Tita is more talented in the kitchen which because of like you know misogyny that's like oh that's yeah. how you're gonna keep your husband yeah. and you know at least like it would 
kind of justify her being like mean more and wanting to keep Tifa away from Pedro. And like, obviously she has enough justification because uh, they keep making eyes at each other and they're not subtle about anything. No. <laughs> But Everyone like, in that room knows. <laughs> like, can you imagine like g joining them for dinner and you're just like, "What is going on?" God. Um, but yeah, I feel like they, Laura Esquivel did kind of drop the ball on Rosada because I think she had a really interesting chance or really good chance of being an interesting character, and just they just characterized her as being like. You know, she's a shrewish, nagging woman who, oh God, gained some weight. I know. Yeah, that's one thing I was saying too, um, Kara. I, I think I must have said it too, where it's like, this book has such weird things to say about women in general. Because at times I'm like, this is so powerful and feminist. And then I'll be like, oh, you took it all back with that next line. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, let's them want them to make their own choices. Now there's, violence against them now we're shaming women and i'm like huh yeah i was like really uncomfortable with the way sexual assault was just thrown out it's like i don't know what to do with this character so she got raped and ran oh away to another village and i'm like what and then like that was another thing that like there was kind of like a from my from the way i read it it seemed like there was kind of conflicting feelings about how to handle it because on the one hand i feel like laura esquivel did like deal with the trauma of that a little bit like we hear about how like chencha is not okay after like she's not the same she like it takes years for her to be ready to to get married to somebody mm -hmm. um and i love the way that like her husband is like of course i don't think you're damaged goods like of course i want to marry her like all of that was lovely but it's what like <laughs> what's that it's like that's what he should say it's right yeah. it's like that's kind of the bare minimum the but it was, still, <laughs> it was still exciting so there's stuff like that but then there was like the fact that it, yeah like i mean it was with at least two or three different female characters i think if i'm mm -hmm. remembering correctly where it's like just in the middle of a scene that had like nothing to do with what was going on it's like mm -hmm. and then she couldn't tell her the story she heard because she yeah. got raped on her way home and i'm like what the actual fuck? like name? my note in my phone from that exact scene. My, my jaw, jaw dropped. dropped? <laughs> yeah. it was like, she's on her way to tell Mama Elena, oh, this happened. And I'm like, yeah. whoa. Yeah. Whoa. The yeah. only thing I can think of for maybe why this was a thing is like, I am assuming because there's a revolution and there are a lot of soldiers around, it was probably a very dangerous time for women. And my understanding of magical realism, specifically from Latine cultures, is that there's a lot of, not a lot of sexual assault, but that is sort of like, an element there because it's sort of building off of like colonialism anxieties like because a lot of women were you know assaulted back then i don't know if that's that's me reading it in the most positive light i can <laughs> but that but. would make sense based on the context of this book like they do they do talk about like the danger of having all these soldiers around and everything so that's a good point i'm glad you brought that up taylor yeah. Um, is, do we have anything to say about Gertrudis? Because we can talk about the revolution, which I thought was interesting. I feel like that girl just needed her own book. I was like, I I'm love glad her. you're here. You're so interesting, but you're really confusing me from what's going on. Like, let's tell your story <laughs> later because you're cool. Yeah. Her book yeah. was so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how she became like a soldier. She's yeah. the captain. Like, She's like, you know, I was a prostitute, but then I thought, let's join the revolution. I'm like, girl, okay. Yeah. And like, she's got her husband and her like right-hand man is also in love with her. And I'm like, yeah. you go, girl. That's what I'm talking about. Again, like a spicy dynamic. I love it. Yeah. Um, so I did want to talk about the revolution. Um, da -da 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 -da. So like, we have a lot of rebellions and revolutions in this book because this takes place during the, I believe, Mexican Revolution. I know Pancho Villa is a character, not a character, but he's in the background. And you have this revolution in the background that, you know, the characters other than Gertrudis don't really get involved with, but it's always there. Mm -hmm. And at least for me personally, I thought the sort of revolutions sort of played into like what's going on inside the home. You've got Gertrudis rebelling. You've got Tito who wants to and eventually does run away from home. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. I just thought it was an interesting element. I agree. I think it was like a good 
parallel to like thematically, you know, like rebelling against tradition and like what you should be doing according to some people. And, you know, like if you don't feel it's right, then you're rising up against it, like that whole kind of thing. So I didn't, I should have done more research to like fully understand the conflicts that were happening. Because in my head, I was like, I know this would be better if I like made more sense of it. But yeah, there's just like war going on. (laughs) Um, However, I do think thematically it tied in really nicely. Yeah. I I think also like it kind of, I I don't want to say like raised the stakes exactly, but it kind of what you guys were saying about like mirroring what's happening. It's like the characters in the house, which is like the majority of the story takes place in this, in this home, like, they're kind of fighting for control of their lives and like Mm. on the outside people are fighting to like you know save their lives so I thought that was like I like that you guys brought up that kind of like mirror thing yeah and also I think it's really nice that it's not always a big part of the story but I feel like when a lot of wars happen like obviously there's a lot of destruction but you also have people who are living in areas where like the war is there and you hear touches of it but it's not always you know in your life all the time yeah yeah um, so I also wanted to ask about how you felt about the role of tradition in this book. You know, we've had we have a couple of traditions <laughs> here. <laughs> Fiddler on the roof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know if you had any thoughts on. I think we have a couple of traditions here. Yeah, I think like the. Um... <sighs> The your youngest daughter must die miserable and alone is like definitely a prominent one in this book. But I do like it's interesting because like while I was reading the book, it kind of felt like one noted like, oh, clinging to traditions is always a bad thing. But then at the end, there's that bit about like, oh, when Tita dies, we're going to lose all this traditional knowledge. And also the fact I just realized John Brown's grandmother her remedies were traditional. So like actually in hindsight, I think the book is more balanced about that than I initially thought. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, Kara, because I wanted to say that too about like, you know, without Tita, like who's going to carry on these recipes and the way we make things? Because I thought that was like such a beautiful kind of balance to all this like, ooh, enough of these traditions, like kind of energy. It's like, yeah, some traditions are like beautiful and nice. And then, you know, as long as you're not using them to like manipulate your family, like tradition's a great thing. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Let people make choices, but also like embrace, you know, the way things have been done. When Yeah, like something is not, something is not good or bad just because it's old. It's like you have to decide. Yeah. What did you say, Julia? I think I cut you off at the end. I was agreeing with what you were saying. (laughs) (laughs) You also have this idea of traditions that are sort of like end with, a solid end. So like if Tita had taken care of Mama Elena for the rest of her life and not passed on her recipes to like anyone, that's just an end of her, like that tradition end of her. Whereas her tradition of cooking and passing that on keeps Tita alive. And you also have other traditions that maybe aren't as bad or get defied. So like Gertrudis having to be like a virgin when she gets married. She throws that out the window. and takes up with a hot soldier, so <laughs> good for her. <laughs> I, I love that the book pointed out that it's like she was too much for him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Taylor, I didn't mean to like no, interrupt. No, your that. Thoughtful point. <laughs> and then you have that tradition of the like marital bedspread or blanket, mm-hmm. which I don't think was more. I think it was more of a neutral sort of role in the story but I just really like how big it, big it gets yeah um and also that weird con- consummation blanket yeah that's what I was just gonna mention yeah. I was like I forgot historically that those were like a thing where it's like you're having sex but don't look at it like, yeah like, yeah <laughs> weird thing I, I yeah yeah I thought it was interesting too that um the book notes that Pedro only ever had sex with Rosara like through that blanket which I think kind of implies that even at this time like people didn't always use it but he did because he didn't like his wife like yeah. which yeah. like okay Pedro yeah you had to marry her you didn't have to have sex with her so much so like <laughs> like he's yeah just Pedro acting like he had no choice in anything when he is the one who is screwing <laughs> up everything is just a lot for me to take 
yeah, I guess I'll have sex with my wife. She's like, yeah. oh, whatever, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, like, yeah, we, we have no idea how Rosara felt about it, but... <laughs> yeah, I that tradition, I'm, I'm happy it's not used as much anymore, <laughs> just because it's creepy. <laughs> Yeah. And maybe that's just because I saw it on The Handmaid's Tale first, and I was like, mm. there's no way that ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, what did you think about the story being told by Tita's great niece? I forgot most of the way through. Like, <laughs> uh, the first couple chapters, I was like, so are we coming back to the narrator, or we're just still going with Tita? Okay. And then by the end, and it came back to her, I was like, oh, yeah, she started this story. <laughs> um, you know, in a way, that's really beautiful, because it is a story about family and, you know, like, tradition. So, like, things being passed on and stuff. Um, and what was it, actually, that she at the end. I can't remember now. Oh, she was talking about the Christmas rolls. That's what it was. Um, yeah, so I just, you know, kind of like the the idea of like, you know, she's sharing Tita's story and then like, you know, theoretically, like it's going to keep getting passed down, like the recipes and the da 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 whatever. But also we see like, okay, things are changing too, which is a nice way to go. Yeah. I, I liked it. Um, I think one of the reasons I liked it is because it made the whole book kind of feel like a little bit of a fairy tale or like a like a like a family oh, story, Lord. like you were saying, that's been like passed down, um, which I just think added like an interesting element. And I think that kind of went along with like the magical realism feeling is like mm -hmm. it does feel a tiny bit like a fairy tale. Um, and even some of the word choices and everything and like the way these um, very everyday scenes are just mixed in with these very out there scenes and like that's just how things are in fairy tales and that's how things are in this genre sometimes um, from my limited experience and I think like if the narrator had been an actual character who like got a little page time and we were supposed to care about, I think it would have frustrated me. Cause it's like, we, we clearly are here for Tita and like her story. Like, why are you in the book? But because she literally was just a frame device, like it didn't bother me. I actually liked it. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. I think my original assumption going into the book was that it was going to be like the narrator talking about her life and her love life. And then like a chapter about Tita and like how their lives reflect each other. But I really liked the fact that, the narrator just shows up in the beginning and the end. And like you both said, like it adds this sort of fairy tale or retelling element. And I think it also makes some of the magical realism makes more sense because you're like, okay, maybe she's just exaggerating or this was how the story was told and it's not meant to be interpreted this way. It's not literal. Um, I do find it funny that the family passed down this story with all of like the sexy details too. <laughs> Like okay, <laughs> yeah. Some some grandparents are like, you know, I had to walk 15 miles uphill both ways to school, and some families are like, you know, he had an orgasm so amazing he died. <laughs> well, different tradition. Could you, yeah, could you imagine like this narrator's at like a family reunion? It's like, oh, tell about grandma and grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> and how they sexed each other to death. I love that story. Like, <laughs> It's so funny to me, that scene, though, because, like, initially my reaction was, like, oh, my God, the sex was so good, she almost died. And then, like, two paragraphs later, I was like, the sex was so good, he really did die. Oh, my God. <laughs> it escalated so fast. It was, it was a choice. <laughs> it yeah, so, something happened. And we can like actually talk about the ending if we want to, because... Yeah, spoilers. Yeah. So, the ending where they, you know, get jiggy with it, and I guess the jiggy was so good, Pedro immediately dies. <laughs> <R. I. P. laughs> At least he died doing what he loved, messing yeah. around. Yeah, doing what he loved and never stopped talking about or doing. Like, <laughs> I guess statistically it was likely to happen because he was always trying to have sex with somebody. Yeah, you know what? I don't think that's fair to say, you guys, because Rosara was dead at that point, And clearly what he loved was cheating on his wife with Tifa. Uh -oh. So that element is gone. And the minute he didn't have to do that, he's like, I, I'm a head out. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, it's been real, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, we've got the ending with um, Tita's blanket like covering the entire ranch. I believe in like setting it on fire and her like eating the candles after Pedro dies, which is interesting because obviously there's a lot in this book about fire and passion. So obviously there's like passion inside her and she eats the candles and burns everything. Yeah. But like, what did you think about that ending? What were your thoughts? Sarah. <laughs> um it was a lot <laughs> like <laughs> some of it like I love the image of the the blanket and I'm glad you mentioned that specifically Taylor because especially when they they talk about how it like trails behind her like a bridal train I think mm -hmm. like that's just such a strong image and I really liked that um and then there were some parts of it that just like yeah I, I don't know how much of it was just like surprise and how much of it was like oh this feels like it was weirdly integrated <laughs> to the book um but i also had this weird feeling of like dissatisfaction too like it wasn't just like wow that was wild it was like oh okay like i guess we're done <laughs> like, um because when when tita has that realization that pedro has died and she's like oh like all her candles are gone out and she's never gonna burn again i was like that is really sad like why are we ending with this and then it's like she basically i mean she kind of kills herself like yeah she did we see that trigger warning yeah we did taylor did oh, mention yeah. that but it's like I, I i don't know like i just i think if the book weren't such a quick and compelling read i would feel more dissatisfied you know, it's like, oh, that's where we ended up. And it wasn't like I was super in love with these characters and I'm like so sad that they, that things didn't go a certain way. But I still kind of had this feeling of like, oh, that's what we were building towards. Like I, and I hate that like Pedro is the happy ending. Like that just really offends me deeply. <laughs> it should have been John being that's sex to death. <laughs> <laughs> no, Taylor, that's not correct. I don't want that either. <laughs> Like, listen, Julie, somebody has to get sex to death. I don't know it's gotta be anyone. <laughs> that was John's place. No. <laughs> no, I'm that's. I also, I also could have done without anyone getting that. <laughs> yeah. That, that was ending. my issue with the ending was like, not that people were dying in the, in the middle of sex, but I was like, okay, so you're going to mention John, that sweet angel man in this moment where she's like, all right, this is how I kill myself. Thanks for the tip, John. I was like, this is rude to bring him up right now. Don't bring yeah. him into this. He left, <laughs> with, he left us with a lovely message and you're twisting it into something sick, Tita. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that you used your mom voice, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, I just, I also don't like this implication at the end that like because because Tita has lost her romantic partner life is meaningless and she yeah. should just die like I don't yeah. I don't think we're supposed to read that much into it probably but like it does bother me it's like there are lots of ways that you can find meaning in life and obviously she has just lost an important person to her and maybe I wouldn't have maybe I wouldn't have noticed this so much if Pedro had been a better developed character because it's like really like he's the light of your life <laughs> like this guy <laughs> why um so like i think there were other factors but even without that like it just does not sit right with me that the ending message is like sometimes one person is all you have and if you don't have them like <laughs> just just leave just like, just eat candles and die i'm sorry i thought your niece was super important to you i guess not like <laughs> um also, I know she's eating like those very traditional wax candles, but I love the idea of her eating like Bath and Body Works candles. <laughs> she's got a three wick and she's like. <laughs> that, that whole image was just like really gross to me. I hate reading about people eating weird stuff. So I was like, no, not like, <laughs> not like this. Girl, you can cook if you're hungry, go get a snack. <laughs> I think I would have preferred if they had both like sexed each other to death. I think oh. like, you're, they're so passionate that they burst into flames and they died because they loved each other so much and no one had it wasn't anyone's fault i guess yeah but yeah this is like, like there wasn't weird... there wasn't like a choice involved of... <laughs> like a weird opposite version of midsummer did you guys watch that movie <laughs> i know about it 
And then I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I want to mention one of Mary Margaret's last comments. She says, legit, this book is so different than what I thought, LOL. And it's like, that's what I told Julia. <laughs> like, I was like, I was like, I don't know. Because like, Taylor, I didn't know if you had finished the book. So I didn't want to like just give it away so i was messaging julia and i was like i don't know what i thought this book was but it was not this <laughs> like, yeah. yeah i feel like a lot of this sounds like and i don't know if either of you watched parks and rec but there's this one scene yeah. where jean ralphio comes in from a night at the club and he's like you miss the craziest of crazies <laughs> like food drinking naked hot tub mom <laughs> And I feel like this is what this conversation has been. Like this whole yeah. chicken tornado, uh, <laughs> farting yourself to death, sexing yourself to death, mom. <laughs> like truly the chicken tornado was the thing that I was like, oh, is this all right? Like that kind of set the tone, I think, for the ending of the book. Like it's hard to come back from a chicken tornado, you know? <laughs> it was like weird enough when she was like, Oh no, not blood on the diapers. And I was like, huh? And then all of a sudden the chicken, it was just, it was weird. Yeah. It was so weird. Yeah. Like that symbolism at least actually like, I think made sense for the story. But then we get to the point where like, oh, wait, like the, the chickens are, are killing each other and now they're a tornado and now they're yeah. like drilling into the ground. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so before we move into quotes, I wanted to ask, like, what recipe or dish from this book would you like to try? Um, you know, um, a lot of these savory dishes sounded amazing, but they all included meats that I don't eat. So they're all <laughs> out. Um, so I really was interested in the what are they like the cream fritters? Yeah, yeah. those sounded that real sounded good. So fascinating to me. So I wanted. I genuinely think I will try to make them at some point. Um, but what I was actually going to make for this live show before I went to the Renaissance Festival and lots of sugar sounded disgusting to me was like the whipped hot chocolate. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. Like that wasn't even a featured one, but she made a whole big deal about making it, and I was like, that sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. especially with milk. Especially with yeah. milk is really good. Yeah. Um, but then you don't boil it as many times. I remembered that right. detail. It also sounds easier. So like. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, those cream fritters sounded really good. The other one I was going to say, um, I have never had quail, so I have no idea if I would like it. But the quail and rose petal sauce sounded amazing. I don't know why, like, rose sauce just sounds delicious to me. Maybe it's because I like Turkish Delight when I've had that before. Um, like Edmund Pevensey. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, that one just sounded really good. Like, I agree. A lot of these really savory ones just sounded so good. Like, there was one that was, like... I, I think a few of the recipes had mushrooms in them, but there was one in particular that I, I don't even remember what it was served with, but it just sounded so good. <laughs> Who knows what it was? Maybe it was the, was it the turkey mole? Mm -hmm. I don't remember. There was lots of things that sounded delicious in this book. I've been wanting to try mole for a long time. Um, so for me, I think the oxtail soup sounds really good. And it's because it's been on my radar for so long and I've been wanting to try it. Now it does have four tomatoes and I am very much allergic to tomato. So it's a little bit like forbidden fruit. Ooh, <laughs> like a candle per se. <laughs> Is there something you could substitute for the tomatoes? Yeah, I make this one sauce that you put like beets and carrots and red wine vinegar in it and it sort of mimics the like acidity and the mm -hmm. color and the flavor of tomatoes that sounds good okay. by itself like <laughs> it apparently doesn't taste exactly like tomatoes but i haven't had tomatoes in like years so which is which is for the best like <laughs> if you are definitely allergic yeah glad to hear you haven't had them <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so uh does anyone have any quotes that they'd like to share yeah the only one I like specifically marked was John's speech about matches that was so lovely and was just not not appreciated, shall we say. And I'll only read like a part of it because it's quite long. Um, but he says, and let me tell you something I've never told a soul. My grandmother had a very interesting theory. She said that each of us is born with a box of matches inside us, but we can't strike them all by ourselves. Just as in the experiment, we need oxygen and a candle to help. 
In this case, the oxygen, for example, would come from the breath of the person you love. The candle could be any kind of food, music, caress, word, or sound that engenders the explosion that lights one of the matches. For a moment, we are dazzled by an intense emotion. A pleasant warmth grows within us, fading slowly as time goes by, until a new explosion comes along to revive it. Each person has to discover what will set off those explosions in order to live, since the combustion that occurs when one of them is ignited is what nourishes the soul. That was yeah. so good. And I will I say, Laura that. Escobel's writing style, like, it flows so well and it comes off yeah. so pretty. Yeah, yeah, I really liked the writing, too. I I forget who translated the okay. edition. Carol Christensen and Thomas Christensen. So props to them and to Laura yeah. Esquivel, because I really liked the writing as well. Yeah. Now I'm looking up who translated my version. Julia, would you like to go? Sure. I have two short quotes I want to share. Um, so, because other than the big John speeches, these these were the ones I saved. Um, so this is actually a random one because it's Mama Elena again. She had two moments I like. Go figure. Um, oh. There's the part where she's talking about like sending Pedro and his family off to get them away from Tita. And he's like, you need a man to defend the house. And she says, I've never needed a man for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Mama, okay. <laughs> um, but then I also really like this quote um, from later in the book that I think this was just like in the narration, but it said, Growing up, one realizes how many things one cannot wish for, the things that are forbidden, sinful, indecent. But what is decent? To deny everything that you really want. I was like, oh, Tita. So good. Um, so for me, I have like the last lines of the book because it just, it did make me emotional about how Tita's story carries on. Um, so how wonderful the flavor, the aroma of her kitchen, her stories as she prepared the Christmas meal or prepared the meal, her Christmas rolls. I don't know why mine never turn out like hers or why my tears flow so freely when I prepare them. Perhaps I am as sensitive to onions as Tita, my great aunt, who will go on living as long as there is someone who cooks her recipes. Ooh, Which like, <laughs> yeah, I love that. That was a really lovely ending. Yeah. Justice for Tita and better men for Tita. Yeah. <laughs> yes. really. um, so, uh, Kara, did you want to tell us about our next month? Yes. Let me, I should have grabbed my copy before we started. So just a second. <laughs> I'm still in the mail, but it should be here, I think, tomorrow, actually. I need to order mine. I'm, like, getting nervous now with the uh, book shortage. You know. I know. Yeah, <laughs> I've, like, been seeing everything that's, like, talking about it's, it sounds like even more than last year, they're like, do shopping early. And I'm like, oh, no. Um, so our book for next month is going to be Sunlight on a Broken Column by Atiyah Hossein. Um, and this was actually just released, like this edition, like I think in the last month or so. Um, and this is supposed to be a classic of, um, it talks about the partition of India. Um, it's first published in 1961. They call it a classic, a classic of Muslim life. Um, and yeah, I looked at some reviews on Goodreads too, and it seems that this is one that people still really enjoy. And it talks a lot about the political climate at the time. Um, our main character is Lila, and she's brought up in her grandfather's household. And I guess he's like, he's kind of strict, but he ends up kind of like opening, like giving her like an opening into this, like basically getting caught up in politics and like actually thinking about what's going on. And I don't think I'm doing a very good job explaining this, <laughs> but it sounds really good and I'm excited for it. And I'm excited it's like back in print because it was out of print for ages. Yeah. Um, and I encourage you to actually look it up on Goodreads to <laughs> learn what it's actually about. <laughs> um, and it's from what I've seen, it looks like Own Voices reviewers like still really like this one. Like it holds up, which is nice, which is good because I believe that um, Atiya Hossein is speaking from her own experience. So, Wow, good. I'm yeah. excited. And that copy of the book you have? gorgeous isn't the it same I edition it. i ordered it's so yeah, pretty it's the, so um, pretty. the virago modern classics one i really like it they um it's one of her other novels in like a similar edition and i'm kind of tempted to get that at some point if i like this <laughs> one so yeah well thank you so much everyone for tuning in and kara and julia thank you so much uh for join joining me and talking about like water for chocolate and chicken tornadoes <laughs> That's really going to be the takeaway from this. <laughs> that, that's yeah. literally all I got from it. Yeah, this month's past it classics out of context. Chicken tornadoes? Chicken tornadoes! <laughs>
Thank you so much. Not even, like we're not even exaggerating like what happened. Like that is like no. literally the scene in the book <laughs> with a chicken tornado. Like <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you next month. Bye. Bye.